13. And this is one of the better known, or maybe it would be more accurately said, more familiar passages of Scripture in the Bible. This is the love chapter. It's read at weddings, rarely at funerals. It, uh, it is put, had been put to song, and uh, lots of people are familiar with 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I would entitle my message that I'd like to share with you this morning in, uh, in this study. I would entitle it Church Glue. Church Glue. There was once a little wayside church. It uh, was a beautiful place. It was a pretty building and a very close-knit fellowship of believers. Then one day the whole thing collapsed. Uh, people largely quit uh, coming to the church for, uh, for study. Um, very few people came out for worship on Sundays. Uh, the prayer meeting went down to zero and uh, Christians in general evangelizing and sharing the gospel with their neighbors. The preacher had to go get another job because there wasn't enough people there to care for his needs. I asked someone what, uh, what happened. And they said somebody stole the church glue and the, f and the place fell apart. They said this is what happened. First, the preacher preached a hard message, something along the lines of dedicating your life to Christ and taking a stand before the world. Some of the members got offended, and they um, started to talk about the preacher behind his back and, and criticizing him. And they got a following. Some... Uh, in anger quickly supported the preacher uh, the preacher himself was hurt and uh, he began to get bitter towards those people in the church that were opposing him uh, hardly anybody in the church had an ounce of patience with anybody else they all expected the other person to ship up or shape up or ship out uh, those in one party were very jealous because uh, more people rallied around the preacher than, than were following them. Some in the preacher's defense began to brag about him and lift him up and demanded public confessions the fifth Sunday after the problem by those in the church that were causing the problem. Each side began to count up all the wrongs that the other people were doing and nobody could see much good in the other in the other people the preacher's older oldest daughter a teenager uh, ran away from home because of all the hypocrisy and the hate that she saw in the church and of course some gleefully reported this news to their friends uh, and and said see what we thought about the treat the preacher was right the one to whom I spoke said that the last thing she'd heard, an old man who had stood up in the church meeting and pleaded for reconciliation was shamefully booed and hissed by several people in the meeting. I ask you this morning, do you think that if each member of the church had been consciously attempting to practice love, that that church would have come unglued? Personally, I think the devil stole the glue and got away scot-free. And this morning, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is telling us about the glue that holds us as a group of Christians together. It is precisely that which God has given to us that will hold us together, that will help us to work in harmony, that will help us to build one another up, that will help God's plan on earth to become realized both to believers and to the unsaved world around us. The church at Corinth to whom the Apostle Paul was addressing this letter was sadly lacking in glue. If you recall from our study of the first 11 chapters in this book, we find that they were divided amongst themselves they were talking about the Apostle Paul. They were bragging about 
this person as opposed to that person. They had their own little cliques in the church. There was great selfishness being manifest in that church. And where there is selfishness, there is no love. These people, furthermore, were so interested in becoming personalities that were admired by other Christians in the church that they weren't caring too much about other Christians. They were only worrying about themselves. And they were seeking to have gifts that were spectacular and prominent so that they would have attention drawn to themselves. And as you recall in our study of this 12th chapter in the book of Corinthians, Paul has been correcting this problem. And basically Paul has summarized that our spiritual gifts and their spiritual gifts are something that God sovereignly, of his own power and his own wisdom, and for his own reasons, gives gifts to each one of us who are his children to use for the benefit of all. And the Corinthians needed that message because they were failing. And Paul's main message in correcting their problem is recorded in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. It is not talking about a man's relationship to his wife, even though this description of love here certainly will hold true in a marriage. But Paul is trying to correct this great lack of love that was being shown by the Corinthians one toward another. So I'd, I'd like to invite you this morning to kind of go through this informally. Um, I'd like to go through the first seven and a half verses in detail this morning. I'd like to point out some observations uh, in the text to show you precisely what Paul is talking about. But most of all, I'd like to emphasize for you what Paul emphasizes, and that is this little four-letter word, love. And I hope that you'll go away with a little better idea this morning of whether or not you, now don't worry about anybody else this morning in this room except yourself. And I'll not worry about anybody except myself. And this morning I hope that we can all go away from this room with a little better conception of whether or not we really have the love of God in our hearts or not. Let's read the first seven verses, the first seven and a half verses. And I'd like you to note that Paul is talking about love. It occurs eight times in this chapter, and it's implied 13 more times. And so this is his main subject. <clears throat> Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not its own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, it endures all things, love never fails. The last verse of chapter 13 says, and now abide, faith, hope, love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. I, don't, I suppose that one of the major causes for discouragement of Christians and for the disillusionment of young believers in the church is the lack of love manifested by those that they expect greater things from. The same thing goes in a marriage. When you are married to a, a partner, you have great expectations of that person. You expect them to show certain attitudes 
toward you. And you understand that you are to show the same attitudes toward them. And when that person fails to express love in action and an attitude toward you, there's going to be problems. The same thing with families. When parents don't show love to their children properly, the children will do almost anything to get it. They crave it. They need it. And homes without love are nothing more than filling stations uh, with bad managers. And uh, the church is the same way. We are a bunch of different entities, as Paul has said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that each believer is a different member. We're not all the same person. We're not all preachers. Right? We have a different function to do. And, and because we are different, we will self-destruct without the glue that holds us together. Without showing love one toward another, naturally, we will fly apart as you would expect an atom to do that is filled with all positive charges that repel one another. You would expect an atomic explosion were it not for the glue that holds it together. This word love that Paul is going to use many times in this chapter is one of at least two different words for love in the Greek language which Paul spoke and wrote at the time this letter was written. One word for love in the Greek language is philos. The other is agape. And Paul's word that he uses all the way through here without exception is agape. And in the Corinthian culture 2,000 years ago when Paul was alive and the people to whom he was writing this letter lived, Agape was not used of human love. Philos was human love, one human to another human. Agape, in the mystery cult religions that surrounded Corinth in southern Greece, agape was used of the love of one God towards another God and the love of a God towards men. It was divine love. And Paul takes this word out of their culture and he plucks it out and removes it from its usage and applies it to human love towards one another. And he implies by doing so that our love to one another and our love to God is to be God's own kind of love. What kind of love was that? Agape is described in 1 John 4, 9 and 10 as being a characteristic of God himself. God is agape. He is love. Whatever love is, he is. I read in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse... I just forget the verse. But it's there in verse 21 or 22 that God loved us and gave his son. Divine agape is sacrificial love. It is giving. It is not taking. It is giving. And when Paul uses this word, you're going to come up with these two concepts. You're going to observe that loving, according to Paul, is being like God. It is not being like man. It is being like God. And so this morning, our section in verses 1 to 7, actually the entire chapter, falls into two basic categories. The first three verses are five theoretical cases or illustrations that Paul uses. None of this is fact. It's all theory now. He's theorizing here in the first three verses. Five theoretical cases wherein he is showing the uselessness of spiritual gifts without being exercised in love. It doesn't matter if you're a preacher. It doesn't matter if you're a famous person it doesn't matter if you're a well-known it doesn't it doesn't matter if you're a, a very public person it doesn't matter if you're well respected it doesn't matter if you can speak in tongues 24 hours a day if you can he do healings and miracles it doesn't matter what you can do in God's sight if you don't have love you might as well forget it because you are doing what a pimple does 
it's doing its own thing and it's not working in harmony with the rest of your body and you don't like it. You know, it's causing disharmony. It's doing its own thing. We as Christians have got to realize that we are together. And if we don't exercise our functions in a harmony with God and with the, in the way God would do it, then we're going to help self-destruct the church. Now let's read through the first three verses, one phrase at a time this morning, and to note five gifts that Paul is referring to. He refers to tongues in verse 1. In verse 2, he refers to prophecy and knowledge. Also in verse 2, he refers to faith. And in verse 3, he refers to giving of yourself and giving of your things, which I believe is a descriptive of the gift of helps that he refers to in chapter 12, verse 28. So there are five gifts. These are all prominent gifts, are they not? A person that speaks in, that spoke in tongues was, you know, he was a very prominent person. All eyes were glued on this person when he exercised his gift of tongues. A prophet, like a teacher, like an apostle, stood in front of the people and taught and gave them God's word, a prominent gift. Knowledge, this person in the meeting would all of a sudden stand up and say, I just received a message from God, and it was a prominent gift. The, the gift of faith, being able to do miracles uh, and to expect God publicly to do things was a public gift. It was a prominent gift. Helps. You're doing things and other people are seeing you do them. It's a public, it's a prominent gift. Now, the Corinthians were striving for prominent gifts. Prominence to them meant greatness. To them, the only thing that mattered was that you could be seen doing it. And Paul hammers them very politely and very gently, but he hammers them by sh giving five theoretical cases where a person could have one of these gifts, and if he didn't have love, Paul drew very negative conclusions. He uses three statements here that we're going to summarize with. In verse 1, or rather verse, um, yes, in verse 1, he says that it, if you have the gift of tongues, or literally languages, if you can speak the, all these languages miraculously, uh, and you don't have love, you're uh, like, a, like a brass band gone wild. Uh, you're nothing. I am become as just a bunch of noise. Uh, a person with the ability to speak who doesn't do it in a loving manner, taking into account his brethren and taking into account God's viewpoint of the way he exercises his gift, um, is making a heap big noise and doing a heap little good. And that's the problem. You know. Speech without love is noise. Now, you can find them in the Bible in Psalm 150, verse 5, that God can be worshipped with the, the praise of symbols. There's nothing wrong with symbols. And there's nothing wrong with a brass band, you know, and making music and, and praising the Lord with all kinds of noise. There's nothing wrong with that, but he doesn't want our mouths to be doing what instruments are supposed to do. He wants us to use our mouths lovingly. Uh, I read in the book of James, in the first chapter in verses 26 and 27 of a person that is a religious person and he says that he knows God and he, but he doesn't bridle his tongue he just he's, he's big, a big professor and James turns around and says be doers of the word and not just hearers only true religion is when you get into action you get your feet and your hands dirty by helping other people visiting people and keeping yourself unspotted from the world the whole book of first John is filled with the little phrase if a man say if a man say that he's a son of God and has not love, he's a liar. If a man says that he loves his brother but doesn't fulfill certain conditions, he's lying. And over and over, the great contrast is made between people that use their mouths, Christians, and those that are not using them properly. 
Let's go on to the next one. In, in the first part of verse 2, Paul says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, even if I have the gift of prophecy, that is, giving, getting a message directly from God and giving it to the church, uh, and I don't have love, he goes on to say, I am nothing. I am nothing. That reminds me of something Jesus said in Matthew 7:22 that there's coming a day when everybody's going to stand before the Lord. And there are, these unsaved people are going to stand before the Lord and they're going to say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not prophesied in thy name and done many wonderful works, cast out demons in the name of Jesus Christ? And Jesus is going to turn to those people and he's going to cast them into hell and he says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Just because a person prophesies or preaches, or teaches, or has a great profession, does not make them right. It's got to be based on the Word of God. They have to tell the truth, and they have to do it in love. Paul goes on and says, And, he, and though I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and have not love, the same result, I am nothing knowledge was supernatural knowledge it wasn't just education uh, this was a special gift that was uh, very frequent in the early days of the church before the scriptures were compiled and God would give a person a specific declaration they had uh, intuitive knowledge from God himself about some something or other and they would share it it doesn't matter if a person had that gift if they didn't exercise love if they didn't have this necessary glue to work in harmony with others, they were nothing. In fact, a verse that I'm going to refer to a little later is in 1 Corinthians 8, 1. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Just because a person has knowledge doesn't mean they're exercising it in love. And then, furthermore, he says in verse 2, and even though I have all faith, so that I could even remove mountains and I don't have love, I am nothing. Jesus was the one that gave that little parable. He said that if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, get up and get out of the way, and it would do it. Now, Jesus never did it. Right? And I don't recall anybody in the New Testament that actually did it. But Paul uses it much like Jesus used it as a demonstration of the greatness of faith. It doesn't matter how great your faith is, if you don't have love, you're nothing. I'm nothing. He goes on in verse 3, Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, that's the things I possess, in one act, if I was to give everything away that belonged to me, and furthermore, and though I give my body to be burned, I have not love. It profits me nothing. If I was to sit down in the street like a, like a Buddhist priest I read about a few years back during the, the Vietnam War, doused himself with gasoline and set himself on fire as a protest to the war, if I was to give my body to be burned, total self-sacrifice, and to give everything away that I possess, and not have love, I just wasted myself. Now, it becomes very obvious here from these verses that love is important. Without it, the most spectacular display of spiritual gift and ability is useless. And the three things that Paul summarizes is it's possible for a person to have to make heap big noise and do heap little good. It's possible for a person to have a heap big personality and to be of heap little value. And it's also possible for a person to do heap big work and to get heap no reward. In other words, I can end up doing nothing. I myself can end up being nothing. And I can end up getting nothing. And that's precisely what will happen to you and to me as God's children if we attempt to serve God without love. Warren Wearsby 
said that spiritual gifts, no matter how exciting and wonderful, are useless and even destructive if they are not ministered in love. Let's go on to Paul's description of love in verses 4 to 7. In the first three verses, Paul has given us five theoretical cases. That's all theory. It's hypothesis. He doesn't say there is such a thing as the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. He's just saying, if it were possible to do all of that without love, there are very negative results. And now in verses 4 to 8, Paul lists 17 abiding realities of love. 17 abiding realities of love. Having shown that Christianity without love is useless, he now turns around and shows the positive. He now tells us what love is. He now defines and describes precisely what this key uh, essential glue that binds us together and makes our Christianity worthwhile, what it is. What Paul is going to do here is he's going to stress the practicality, the usefulness, the beneficiality of love in action. Love isn't just something you carry around in your head. It's not just an attitude. It's not just a characteristic that you can't see. Love is something invisible that acts in a visible way. In fact, you will note that there are 16 verbs used in these verses that we're going to read. And every one of them is in the present tense. And in the language of the Greeks, which Paul read and spoke and wrote, a present tense meant two things. It meant that there was something that continued day by day by day by day. That was one thing. That it was unbroken con continuity and secondly, that it was a present reality. It, it really does exist here and now. Love is something that actually does work. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 8, 1, that knowledge uh, makes a person proud in their head. You know, you can, you can really get a big head but by increasing the knowledge. But love edifies. Edify is nothing more in the Greek language than the word to build. It actually is constructive. It performs work. It does things positively. And these verbs that Paul is listing here in describing the word love, which he only uses four or five times, but in, in each case it's implied. The word love is the subject all the way through here. The verbs, the verbs show action. Let's go through them quickly. Love, verse 4, suffers long. Now, all of these things down through verse 6 are particular characteristics of love and action. And, and in verse 7 and 8, you have general characteristics. <coughs> but particularly, first of all, love is long-suffering. That is, it perseveres. And that's precisely what the Corinthians weren't doing. They weren't... Uh, being patient with one another. You find them at the Lord's table, uh, you know, and at the love feast where they had a church family fellowship supper. You know, some people were just going in there and pigging out, and there wasn't enough to go around. They weren't caring about other people. There was no long suffering for one another there. And in chapter 14, in the next chapter that we're going to be looking at, we find that they were doing the same thing with gifts. Instead of waiting their turn in the church to... to to put a little into the me into the meeting, they were five or six of them standing up all at the same time. There was nothing; just a great big mass of confusion. They weren't being long suffering with one another. Love is long suffering. Love is kind. The word kind in Greek means good and serviceable. That is, it's productive. Kindness always shows itself in deeds, which makes sense. And now Paul lists nine negatives in a row. After giving us, starting out on a positive vein, he gives nine negatives. I think Paul is emphasizing these negatives simply because the Corinthians were full of negatives. 
They were doing so many negatives. They were making a lot of mistakes. And so he turns around and he says, this is what love is not. Love is not... Um, love does not envy. Now the word envy simply means to be jealous. In the Greek, it's the same word to burn with envy that he used in verse 31 of the previous chapter. He said, you people are coveting earnestly the best gift. You people are burning with envy to, to have the gift that somebody else is having. You're not satisfied with what you got. You just want what somebody else has got. You're jealous. You're envy. And that was their problem. Love does not do that. Love does not vaunt itself, or literally does not brag, does not boast itself. You've heard of a vainglorious person? That's precisely the Greek word. A person that is so full of themselves that they've got a little halo around their head, they've got 16 blocks piled on their shoulder, and they can do no wrong. Right? Everything they do is okay. Don't criticize him, buddy, or you're, you're going to get it. Love is not like that. It does not vaunt itself. It is not puffed up. This word is related. It comes from the Greek word fusiao. You can almost picture the, the characteristic of this person. It's like a fuse. And the longer it burns, the more hot air it's giving off. And it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon it's going to blow. And that's precisely what the Corinthians were doing. They were proud. You can't miss the pride of the Corinthians as you read through this chapter, uh, or uh, this book. In chapter 4, Paul outright came out and said, you people are proud. He said it in chapter 5. You're proud that there's sin in your midst. And love in action is not proud. Rather, according to what Paul wrote in another place, in Romans 12.10, uh, the proper attitude of a Christian towards another is this. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one another. Here's, the, here's a good little test to, ask your, to show yourself and myself whether I have love or whether we have love. Uh, who do you like to talk about? In a conversation with people, do you catch yourself with eye problems? Always talking about I, me? Can you, can you discuss something with a group of people without putting I in it? Are you so caught up, am I so caught up with myself that I talk about myself all the time? That's a little giveaway. It, love isn't one way directed towards itself. It doesn't boast itself. It's not so proud. Doesn't, it doesn't have a big head. Right? He goes on, verse 5. Love does not behave itself unseemly. That is, in an unbecoming, an unfitting manner. And, my goodness, can't you uh, see what the Corinthians were doing to one another? Uh, I've already mentioned in chapter 11. Oh, you've got to read it to see how unbecoming the behavior of these Christians one to another. Just like, a, like an adolescent child, like a little kid. Solomon was right. He said, foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. And you can see it. You don't have to teach a child to be stupid. They'll act it. They'll act the part all by themselves. They'll act selfish and ignorant, you know, and imbalanced. Big-headed, uh, unbecoming behavior, childish, immature. And love does not do that. It's a good thing marriage is reserved generally for adults because adults are supposed to have matured, see. And God expects us, who are his children, to act like adults, to have love and to practice it not in an unseemly manner. Love does not demand its own. This is intimately related. You can just, uh, actually it says, uh, it does not seek its own. The word is demand. Love doesn't demand its own way all the time. It doesn't strive for it. It doesn't continually seek its own way. These Corinthians were, had this attitude. You read in chapter 6 that they were taking one another to court. 
They were so worried about their own interests, they were demanding their rights. And that's a carnal attitude that Christians, none of us should have. The, actually, the Christian has no rights. You and I do not have a right. Human rights is a misnomer. The only right that we have is to be the kind of creature that God made us to be. Right? If somebody else takes away our right to live, well, God knows about that. I mean, he, he doesn't expect us not to defend ourselves, but there may be occasions where we should give up the right to live. There be occasions we give up the right to our privacy, the right to our time, the right to our money, the right to our friends, the right to enjoyments, the right to spare time. I mean, what determines rights? Authority determines rights. And in this relationship that we have with God, because He is sovereign, we shouldn't be down here in a, a group of Christians that has to work in harmony, being like a, a pimple or something demanding all our way all the time okay. wanting all the attention demanding our own way very wrong attitude love is not roused to anger it the translation here is very good it is not easily provoked it doesn't say that it is never provoked that's impossible Paul says in Romans chapter 12 as much as lies within you be at peace with all men there are going to be occasions when there is a time for righteous anger. But true love isn't walking around like a firecracker ready to go off. You know, the first time somebody pricks you with a pin, you blow. You know, uh, you're not such a touchy person that you can't take anything. And true love is going to be patient. It's going to. It's not going to be easily provoked. It's not going to be easily stimulated. And these Corinthians kind of had this short fuse mentality. Furthermore, he says, Love thinketh no evil. This word think in the Greek language is a bookkeeping term. It means to reckon, to account. It, it means uh, having a little mental checkbook in your, in your mind. And every time somebody does something against you, you put a mark beside their name. And you keep track of it. Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, he's a guy that, uh, you know, talked about you behind my back and so-and-so. Uh, you know, Always remembering and making sure we don't forget the wrongs that other people do to us. Warren Wiersbe writes in his commentary on 1 Corinthians that he met a guy one time trying to be a Christian. And Wiersbe said he was the most miserable man he'd ever met in his life. He actually kept a notebook of the misdeeds and wrongs that other people did to him beside their name. The most miserable person he ever met in his life. Love does not take evil into account. In a marriage you can't do this or you'd never make it. Right? When somebody does something wrong to you or if you do something wrong to your partner, God expects us to overlook it and to be patient and not chalk it up and say, okay, I'm going to get you back. Right? Love does not take evil into account. And furthermore, in verse 6, love does not rejoice in iniquity. That's pretty plain. It, it isn't happy when another person stumbles. It does not, it's not glad when unrighteousness occurs. And this is very, it's a very easy thing to fall into, especially if we're having problems with other Christians and something goes bad. You know, their house burns down. Or their kid runs away from home or their daughter gets pregnant or something. It, it's so easy to be tempted to think, oh, it serves them right. You know, if they'd have been living for the Lord, it wouldn't have happened. We've got to be careful that we don't have that kind of an attitude. The Corinthians actually had this attitude. They were, it wasn't bothering them that there was a guy in the church that came to their church that was living with his mother. Uh, going to bed with his mother is more accurate. Incest. You know, they were proud of it. They were boasting. They were, they were rejoicing in the sin. Can you believe that so-and-so does this? Ha, ha, ha. You see? And they're not doing anything about it. True love doesn't have that kind of an attitude. True love rather rejoices in the truth. Now, this word is the same word in the previous part of the verse with the little word soon, which in the Greek means with added to it. 
it rejoices in harmony with the truth. It's, it's used in verse 26 of the preceding chapter. Whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. If one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. When, my, when something uh, wonderful happens to my daughter, I rejoice with her because I love her and I want to see good things happen to her and I want her to see that I care about her and that's the attitude that true love has. Rejoices with, loves to see good happen to another. Now Paul gets a little general here and the one, two, three, four, five words that he next uses in describing love are all general. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and it never fails. The word things is supplied there. Maybe you could have written in there, it bears up under all kinds of attack. It believes all the good things it ever hears. It hopes all the best for the other. It endures all difficulties and it never ever once falls down to die now that's Paul's description of love it's true that love does enrich all it touches and may we this morning be encouraged to have the love of God in our hearts manifested to one another so that we will not become unglued Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father,